Welcome everyone to My Evolution with Verathena. Um, we've got a great group of diverse panelists today to discuss our experience with Verathena. Um, and on behalf of the panelists, I'd like to thank Boston Scientific for asking us to come speak and talk about a product that we've been using for many years. Um, I would like to introduce the panelists. Um, my name is Dr. Lisa Darby. I'm board certified in internal medicine, vascular medicine, and venous and lymphatic disease. And I practice um, at Prisma Health at the Center for Venous and Lymphatic Medicine in Greenville, South Carolina. I'm also pleased to introduce beside me Dr. Lena Vargas. Um, she is a board certified vascular surgeon who specializes in vascular and endovascular surgery in Lumina Vein and Aesthetic Institute at Windermere, Florida. And then next to her, we have Dr. Vinay Satwa joining us. He is a board certified interventional cardiologist who performs a variety of complex peripheral endovascular procedures at the Center for Vein Restoration in Greenbelt, Maryland. So what we're going to do today is first introduce Verathena. Uh, then we will each kind of discuss our evolution with the product over the past several years. We'll introduce a case. And then finally, at the end, we'll save questions and panel discussion at that time, okay? Um, so here is the prescribing information on Verathena. You can read this at your leisure. Um, some of the big takeaway points are obviously you want to avoid Verathena if someone has a known polydocanol allergy. Um, as well, it's contraindicated in patients that may have a um, acute venous uh, thromboembolic event occurring. Um, and finally, um, I avoid Verathena if I have any pregnant patients as well. So what is Verathena? It is the first and only FDA-approved polydocanol foam. It is a chemical ablation for varicose vein tributaries, truncal issues such as GSV enlargement and reflux, as well as anterior accessory saphenous vein issues. It treats any vein shape from two millimeters to over 20 millimeters in size. It treats problems both above and below the knee. Um, it is a great product for tortuous recurrent um, varicose vein tributaries, and it treats seep classification anywhere from C2 to C6. The great thing about Verathena is it does not require incisions. It's non-thermal and no tumescent is required. So how does Verathena work? Um, it creates a very consistent and reliable cohesive foam that's better than the physician compounded foam that we traditionally used. It has great circumferential uh, contact so that you have complete endothelial destruction with a very low polydocanol concentration. The vein will contract and lead to venous occlusion. And then finally, it has a very great side effect profile because you use low nitrogen bubbles with this product. So my evolution and what has transpired with using the product. First and foremost is the amount of solution. So when we first started using Verathena, we felt, oh, we need to use a lot. Um, it, it's going to take a large amount to travel up that leg. Um, or if the vein is big, we may need more. Over time, I have learned that less is more, that um, we definitely lose, use a uh, lower amount of solution than we did years ago. Um, the other issue that's changed over time is access. So initially, we were trying a variety of products, both with butterfly access, gel co, micropuncture, et cetera. I have found the best reliability is with the micropuncture, and I will tell you that even if you can get two to three centimeters of that micropuncture catheter in, it is definitely going to be a more stable device um, because, again, you're going to be eventually elevating the patient's leg, putting on a wedge. If you're using a butterfly, it traditionally can move around and cause some problems um, before injection. So I love the micropuncture and have had great success with that. And then finally, it's the veins treated. So of course, when you're just starting out with a product, you want to cherry pick who your patients are. You want it to be a pretty straightforward case of an enlarged GSV in the thigh. Um, and so that's initially what we started with just to get comfortable with the product. And then over time, we've progressed to now using this for all kinds of vein sizes, tortuous branches where you may only have two centimeters to access 
uh, patients that have extensive scar tissue throughout the GSV that again may make access difficult. Um, the other patient group that does well are those that have had vein stripping in the past and they have neovascularization, they have perforators, they develop these enlarged tortuous varicose vein tributaries both above and below the knee. They do very well with this product and I'm definitely more comfortable treating those than I was years ago. So for my first case, um, this is a 47-year-old female. She had a history of varicose veins, leg pain, swelling, aching for many years. She worked as a housekeeper, so she was standing on her feet for prolonged periods, and the pain in her legs had become so much that it was lifestyle limiting. She was having difficulty performing her job. Um, as well, the veins were getting larger and more tender and sore. And on this picture, you can definitely see the appearance of those varicose vein tributaries that we're talking about in the distal thigh region. So on her standing venous study, the left GSV measured anywhere from three to eight millimeters in size. She had documented reflux of three to 11 seconds throughout the thigh and calf region. Um, and what was so noticeable about her was even the standing venous showed an area of eight millimeters. When I was scanning her on the pre-op visit, she had an area in that proximal thigh now up to 10 millimeters in size. So again, years ago, I would have said, oh gosh, this vein is too big. I'm worried about virethena and complete contact with that diameter. But actually, as you'll see, it does great. So on our pre-op visit, we typically see the patients the day before. Uh, we go ahead and mark the access site where we're going to attempt access. I want my patients to have a nice, comfortable experience, so we do use a small amount of Imla cream on the access site to just help with any discomfort. As well, and I think this is very important, when you're scanning your patients the day before, you can definitely pick out areas that may be problematic. So, you know, areas that are enlarged, a possible perforator, uh, tortuous areas, access issues, all that is easier to spot the day before instead of when you're, uh, you've got the patient on a wedge. It's much harder to see those things. So again, we use that pre-op visit to find any areas that may be problematic. I ensure that they do have thigh-high compression stockings as well. I'm a firm believer in the compression and using that after this procedure. So we make sure that, that they already have their thigh-high stockings. Um, we also use either naproxen for any post-op discomfort or they can use over-the-counter Advil, Tylenol is fine as well. I have nitro paste on here, and again, that's reserved for patients that may have very small diameters, like a two millimeter. And, or if you have a patient who's nervous and you're worried about vasospasm, that may help you out a little bit with access. So once we get them in there, we do all of our procedures under sterile technique, um, and our vein is accessed with micropuncture. I then want to confirm before I inject the virethena where that virethena is going to go. And I have learned over time, I do somewhat rigorous um, injections with a 10 millimeter syringe of just normal saline. And if you do a robust injection, you can actually see the saline bubbles travel up that vein or where, where your treated vein is going to go. And in times I have seen all kinds of things. I've seen it go in a perforator and in the deep system where I, had, I did not visualize before. Um, we've even had patients that had extravasation. You could see saline going around that you would not expect. Um, and it has saved us from some complications because I'm able to visualize. Okay, um, let's see this video real quick. Let's see if I can. So this is a video of, that is just saline flush. So that gives me great confirmation and reliability that, hey, before I inject my virethena, I know exactly where my virethena is going to go with using the saline flush. Again, it and it also helps with vasospasm. I feel like these patients injecting that continual um, normal saline, and it, sometimes it's cold, it will help with vasospasm as well. And again, for patients, we want to elevate their legs on the virethena provided wedge for at least five minutes, again, possibly longer based on their anatomy and how big the vein is. So we even had a virethena rep with us that day, and it was, it was pretty incredible that that 10 millimeter vein that we saw the day before, um, and we were watching it in, 
as the leg was elevated that after, after seven to eight minutes of elevation with the wedge and Trendelenburg and the saline flush, that 10 millimeter greater saphenous vein had decreased to three millimeters in size. So that gives us that great confidence that when we inject the Virathena, is going to have great endothelial contact completely around that vein. So patience works. And I'm saying that because as providers, I feel like sometimes we get in a rush, we get that access, we get excited, we wanna hurry up and get it in so we don't lose access. Um, but actually you wanna try to wait, empty out that vein, get the vein as small as you can before you inject the Virathena. So for this patient, um, I think this is a video as well, might be hard to see. Um, but as we're injecting the Virathena, obviously you can see it, it's bright white. It is, there is no doubt where that Virathena is going, and you can see it on our ultrasound screen. For this individual and based on the size of her vein, years ago I probably would have used eight, nine uh, mLs of Virathena, but for her we actually only used 6.5 mLs of Virathena for treatment of this vein. Um, when we do our Virathena, I do have an extra pair of hands to help hold some distal pressure initially. Um, as well, another little trick that we've used is we have the patient dorsiflex their foot. As we're injecting, this will help close off some of the very small perforators that you may not visualize and again help with any potential problems. And over time, a slow injection of Virathena is, is better than a very fast injection. It will allow the Virathena to travel, um, and also it will help with spasm of the vein. So as it's spasming and working in the distal segment, it will actually help some spasm in that proximal segment. So at last, again, I'm a firm believer in the stockings. Uh, following treatment. So we put a class one thigh high compression stocking on all our patients. We then use a, the Robbie pads provided and I'm the firm believer in those. And I will use two, sometimes three if I'm treating a large segment. Again, we then over, over the top of that, we use a Coban color of choice uh, for patients. Um, it does help reduce pain, swelling, aching, and discomfort following the procedure. Uh, our patients are traditionally called on post-op day two just to ensure they're not having any issues or access site erythema or any pain. And then we do a follow-up ultrasound in one week to ensure that there's no DVT and that the vein is closed off. And so here is our patient at one week follow-up. Already, as you can see, those varicose vein tributaries in the distal thigh have disappeared. Um, she's had dramatic improvement in pain and swelling and aching, um, and the ultrasound showed that the left GSV was closed through the thigh region, again, with this patient minimal to no bruising following the procedure, and she was able to return to work in a very timely manner. Next up, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Vargas. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. So um, my evolution, some of these will sound a little bit repetitive, but again, this is what makes, what, what makes Varithina a very special and unique product. So, you know, prior to having Varithina, and I, I don't know how many of you are in Florida, but um, Florida was actually the last state in the United States for Varithina to be approved in. So there was a big, big experience with, you know, all of the other te techniques prior to having Varithina. So, um, the, you know, prior to that, we had the typical alternatives, but then if you encounter a patient who has had treatment in the past and has uh, recanalization or they have scarring or they have a GSV that it's extrafacial and too close to the skin to where you may be uncomfortable doing a typical thermal closure, um, the alternative was using physician compounded foam, which we know um, is suboptimal, both in its efficacy and also in its safety profile. So obviously having a uh, varithina available just opens up um, a whole new, you know, just a world of, of uh, just a very optimal treatment in some of these patients that are difficult, that are challenging in that the typical things that we have available are just not good alternatives for them. So, um, and then um, now the other big advantage in, in my opinion is being able to treat, do a more complete treatment in one setting. So whereas before we may only do uh, the, the thigh and maybe the proximal calf uh, with thermal, what happened to the, the distal portion of that GSV and 
while in, in some people, maybe most people, that's not an issue long term, I do feel that leaving that distal aspect of the GSV untreated sometimes can be, um, can be suboptimal and may become a problem later down the line. Um, same thing with patients who may have very little reflux proximally and they have more reflux distally, or um, those patients that obviously have um, varicose veins where we would only do the thermal treatment but leave those untreated thinking that, yeah, you know, they're not going to be under so much pressure, so chances are they're going to be fine. But at the end of the day, I, 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 this is just my personal experience, I feel that leaving those, you know, that, that's definitely a choice and it's not like it's going to be a bad thing. You may just have to la later down the line come back and, and take care of them if they start being fed by uh, a new uh, varicose vein or a... Um, perforator that becomes incompetent. So it's just nice, in my opinion, to try to be able to do a very thorough and complete treatment. And varithina obviously is the only option to be able to treat both the truncal and uh, the tributary varicosities with one single treatment that is very, very simple as Dr. Darby already explained. Um, the, other, the other place where I think varithina plays a huge role is in patients that, um, that have skin compromise, right? So we all have seen those patients that have ulcers, or even if it's not ulceration, but uh, maybe just some stasis dermatitis like um, I'll be showing in my case. You probably don't want to go through that skin as far as access, and so varithina just gives you um, probably the best alternative to be able to really do that complete treatment in that area underneath an ulcer to be able to get all of those um, subdermal varicosities that are just very important in making sure that that ulcer is going to heal at the end of the day. Um, None of, the other, none of the other existing treatment options are as ideal as varithina in that situation. The alternative would be ultrasound, you know, um, physician compounded foam, but then again, we know that that is not as effective or, and maybe not as safe as uh, varithina is. Um, and then, you know, I, I personally love uh, phlebectomies. I know that's not the majority of you, but, um, but it, there's, it's definitely an option for, you know, a lot of people who have varicose veins and they're just not excited about undergoing a phlebectomy. Um, like your case, you just showed, it's, it's just a, a, a really beautiful treatment for, for tributary varicosities, even on patients who, you know, have no, none of the other sort of like special circumstances, but it's just another tool in an armamentarium that we can give patients the option of choosing um, as their treatment. So like I already went over some of these, but the advantages that are unique to varithina are uh, the ability to treat uh, veins of multiple sizes regardless of whether they're straight, whether they're tortuous, if they're completely uh, you know, normal and virgin, or if they have been treated before and have scarring or synechia, like it, it, just, it just gives you a lot of, it's a very versatile tool that allows you to pretty much treat anything at this point. Um, and obviously, like Dr. Darby was saying, because we're not using any, um, any um, thermal methods, we don't need any tumescence, and obviously you don't require any sort of incisions, and, and access is pretty straightforward with micropuncture, which is also my preference. Um, I do once in a while uh, use a butterfly, uh, but I, I only use it if I know, um, and, and this comes with experience, but if you're, I definitely elevate the legs before I go in with a butterfly. You're, it's, it's not going to stay in place if you put it in and then elevate the legs, it's not going to happen. Like you can absolutely assume 100% of the time that thing is going to come out. So if you're going to use a butterfly, just, you know, your, chances are you're going to be able to get it uh, even if the legs are elevated, but I wouldn't try it before elevating them. It's just not stable. Whereas with the micropuncture, you can do whatever you want. You can move them around. You can elevate them that thing is going nowhere, so. And obviously it's a, it's a really nice lumen to deliver the medication. The smaller the lumen, it's just, it's, it's not the same. The, ha the, the larger the lumen of your access uh, device, whether that's micropuncture, butterfly, the better um, the delivery is. So my case, uh, my patient is an 83-year-old female with multiple medical comorbidities. She had had a history of um, bilateral grade saphenous vein thermal ablations in the past, uh, and she presented with the typical symptoms of pain, heaviness, aching, 
uh, swelling as well as stasis dermatitis. I apologize that this picture is the quality is very, very low. It's a degradation from my electronic medical record, but um, along with the dermatitis, she had significant itching and cramps. Uh, this is her vein mapping, so um, I'm just gonna focus on the left leg, which is the, 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 the leg that I included for this case. So her great saphenous vein uh, is closed proximally and then she has a tributary varicosity uh, on that side as well. So um, this is just a picture. So the, the, the two pictures to your uh, left are the ones for her case. I just only included the one on the right to show that sometimes in her case I didn't because her, proct her GSV at the thigh was closed. But in most patients, if I'm planning to treat the GSV proximally, I may just from the get-go get two axes, because then once I'm elevated, if the one distal axis is enough for everything, then I literally just pull it out. But trying to, once you have just one axis, your leg is up, you're ready, you're, you've started, and for whatever reason, the foam is not making it up to where you definitely want to make sure that the proximal GSV gets enough foam, you're in a harder situation. So sometimes, again, I, that's the only reason why I included that picture is to show that I have my two access sites um, with uh, micropunctures, which are very, very stable. Uh, but then in her case, I only used one, that distal one, because her proximal GSV was fine, and I was pretty confident that the medication was really going to make it up that, body, like that distal GSV and then the varicose veins that I was trying to treat. There should be a video. Maybe not. Oh. Okay. So yeah, pretty much, you know, for the purpose of, of just showing how it is, it is uh, clear as day uh, that you can see when the foam is coming in and where it's going. Um, but it is important, I think, and Dr. Darby uh, made a good point as far as like having a second person that can help you with compression. Obviously, in this case, it wasn't as necessary to hold the proximal GSV, uh, but just sometimes to hold some perforators that, you know, you may see most of them, but sometimes you see some of the foam trying to go um, deeper through a, a point where you are not suspecting. You can, if you're going slow, you can easily catch that before you've delivered a ton of medication down to the deep system and someone can help you hold that. Um, so again, just to reiterate, why varithina in this patient? She had, um, she had some scarring uh, in the portion of the distal GSV, like distal thigh that um, had recanalized, so I definitely wanted to make sure that we were closing that. Varithina, obviously the foam will get through all of that with no problem. Um, able to treat both of her issues in one setting. Um, and then with that, just having the confidence that you're doing a more complete and thorough treatment with a medication that is very, very stable and very, very safe as long as you're following um, you know, the, 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 the recommendations as far as leg elevation, making sure that that vein really goes into spasm, staying you know, within the indications as far as the volumes and the amount. Um, and then obviously the, the compression at the end of the day, you're gonna, you're gonna have a very, very safe, safe alternative. And obviously this patient, she didn't need an intimescence. I didn't wanna go through all of that um, skin with dermatitis and irritation. And obviously there's no risk for, of nerve injury or any, any or other sort of uh, injuries like we worry with uh, tumescence. Um, so for this patient at uh, six weeks, she was pretty happy with um, her symptoms as far as improvement in her pain and achiness, and significantly the dermatitis had improved quite, quite dramatically. Um, and um, her varicose veins also improved significantly without you know, any, any significant induration or tenderness or discoloration. All right, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Sawa. All right, good afternoon, everybody. Everybody get their coffee and, and their snacks and their desserts in the back. Christine, I gotta say, it's a good problem when you're adding chairs to a room, right? So thank you guys for being here today. This is phenomenal. This room is filled uh, with a great panel of speakers that you've seen with Dr. Darby and Dr. Vargas, who've come um, from such a far ways to share these wonderful cases. And uh, you know, again, I think that at the end of the day, what I take out of this conference 
is the fact that we can't be, if I maybe use the term, a one-trick pony. We should not be a one-trick pony. In other words, we shouldn't try to perform the same uh, ablation modality on every single patient for every single disease subset, right? We have to offer them op options. We have to know what else is in our toolbox because if all we do is the same procedure on the same patient, we're not delivering the best quality of care. And these cases are what illustrate that, right? These are patients that may not have had options otherwise. So just before I get started, by a show of hands, who here is using Veratheon already in their practice? Excellent. About half the room. Who here is using physician compounded foam in their practice? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. And so up until I was introduced to Veratina, when I was first brought upon, I said to myself and to the rep, what's the big deal? I've been using polydocanol for years, right? Ultrasound guided foam. Guys, you didn't come up with something amazing here. I hate to bury the barrier bad news, but this has been around, right? And they said, you know what, doc? What about your distal GSV closure rates? What do you do for those distal GSVs? Because we know that you do not want thermal injury. We get it, right? So I said, physician compounded foam. And they said, well, tell me what percentage of these distal GSVs are actually closing. And when I went back and looked at the data, it was a little alarming for me because it was about 50%, right? And so as I started to utilize Verathena in the distal GSV calf segments, it made a lot of sense to me. The closure rates went up above 90% in these patients. So clearly, Verathena was onto something, right? As I started to become more and more comfortable with that, then I said, what about these patients that I've treated in the past that have had some type of thermal modality, but they come back with symptomatic disease down the road, right? If you have, have you know, practiced as long as I have, then you know, you'll start to see these patients come back over years and say, hey, I felt great when you treated me the first time, but unfortunately my symptoms have recurred. Well, what do we do in that scenario? Because we know that that, that that vein is scarred down, right? And trying to get a catheter into that vein and that patient's in a lot of discomfort, we needed to have other options. And so that's where I started to utilize Varathena because you can actually see the medicine very nicely get into those little cracks. The next step for me was, what about these ulcer bed patients that I have that I'm trying to do, use these ultrasound modality, I'm trying to use physician compounded foam, maybe I can bet clo get better closure rates if I use Varathena there. And then along those lines, as you know, the esteemed doctor spoke about decreasing phlebectomy sites. I do phlebectomies, and I think phlebectomies are important in your practice to do on patients, select patients. But the amount of phlebectomy sites have gone down precipitously for me because of the fact that I do not have to make so many of those marks and stabs in the patient to break the vein because that medicine is making its way into those uh, tortuous segments. And then finally, again, this is a graduation, ladies and gentlemen. Don't let me stand here and, and, and fool, to, fool you into thinking that I was the professor of Verathena from day one. I was not. I made a lot of mistakes along the way. And I always say, if you want to learn Verathena, come to me because I'll share all my mistakes with you, right? Eventually, as we graduate up to the level of becoming more confident and proficient in utilizing Verathena, then I started utilizing in the above-knee GSV compartment. And the closure rates have become, have, have been excellent as we become more and more skilled in this, and we've come up with some protocols and steps that we'd be happy to share with you at some point. So that was my evolution. Again, I didn't start using Verathena on day one and having excellent, excellent closure rates because it was a learning curve for us. So with that, I'd like to get into the first case here. This is a 46-year-old female. She uh, is an ICU nurse for many years, and she's been complaining of hyperpigmentation in her right ankle, and over time started having a skin breakdown. So she noted heaviness and achiness, but she said, you know what, I mean, I'm a nurse. I've been on my feet for years. Of course I'm supposed to feel heavy and achy, right? She's wearing compression stockings. She's doing all the things she's supposed to do, but she started noticing over the past three months that she's having skin breakdown around that area. She was evaluated by her primary care doctor and placed on antibiotics and recommended wound care. Fine. So she started doing that, but unfortunately, this ulcer kept recurring. And so during one of her ICU shifts, she talked to one of her vascular surgery colleagues, a PA that was making rounds, and she said, hey, take a look at my ankle. What do you think? And she said, oh, that looks very painful. And she said, yeah, I've been having this problem. I thought it was my shoe. I thought it was scraping. She's coming up with all kinds of reasons why she would have this, right? That PA looked at her and said, listen, I think this is chronic venous insufficiency. You have that discoloration. You have that characteristic look, right? So this patient was then brought to our practice, and where we started with was, again, bread and butter stuff. We started with a venous duplex ultrasound, and we checked for reflux. And no surprise here, the patient had right GSV reflux greater than one second from the saphenofemoral junction down to the mid-calf compartment with saphenous tributaries that were feeding the base of the ulcer. Very nicely seen. 
The other thing that was noted was that the GSV did exit the fascia, so it was a little tortuous. So in a world where I would have been using thermal modalities, it would have been very difficult to ablate the entire segment. So what are my options at this point? Well, continue compression and, uh, and continue wound care, which is not wrong, right? It's certainly a good adjunctive measure. Should we continue to assess for other infectious causes? Well, I think you know once you've assessed it, you've ruled it out. Should we go ahead and treat the incompetent GSV, or should we check for something else above the inguinal ligament? Should we look for pelvic venous outflow narrowing? Who in the room here treats patients with pelvic venous outflow narrowing? Excellent. So we have a couple of, couple of colleagues in the room. So what are our modalities? We know that thermal modalities exist. We know they work. I'm not going to stand here and say don't use thermal modalities, right? They work. They exist in the right patient, right, in the right disease state but we need to be well-versed in the non-thermal modality. And so we know that this modality, this varathena modality, will allow us to get into that base of that ulcer. So, but the question then was, if I choose varathena, how do I make sure that that medicine is not making its way through that saphenofemoral junction into the deep system? Because that was what my initial concern was. How much of this medicine is actually getting into the deep system, right? Am I going to cause more blood clots down the line in these patients? And one of my colleagues alluded to, is the vein diameter too large? How large is too large, right? And are there other effective techniques or modalities that are safe and reproducible? Or is there something that exists? Well, again, we have verathena. We should utilize verathena, especially in cases like this. Elevation is the key to success, right? That is one of the major problems I had initially. I was not elevating the leg. I wasn't waiting long enough. Patience. Patience is the key to success with this disease, uh, with this treatment modality. So get the access, elevate the leg, talk to the patient, talk to your colleagues, get the room set up, and that three to five minutes will go by very quickly. And at that point then, we went ahead, we got access, we can get into the tips and tricks during the Q&A session, but got access into the distal thigh compartment and then into the distal calf segment and went ahead and injected verathena. Uh, we chose to give uh, about five cc's in the thigh compartment and an additional five cc's below. This is just a video just showing it, but you've seen this. How did this lady do? Look at this, at three months. At three months, it's already starting to close. At six months, she's coming in, she's hugging and kissing everybody in the office. Look at nine months. At nine months, we completely cured this lady's ulcer. It closed the ulcer completely in nine months. And believe you me, there's not a week that goes by that somebody from that hospital comes to our practice because she has become, you don't need billboards. You need your patients to be your billboards. You do the right, right thing for your patient. You treat your patients like family, which I know you all do. The patients will go out there and get more patients for you, right? That is how you build your practice and continue to stay in your community, as everybody here does. Finally, second case, a 62-year-old male. This gentleman came in also with the right medial ankle ulcer. About four years he's been complaining about this ulcer, but he just wants to be left alone. Just leave me alone. He wants to ride his motorcycle. Just leave me alone. Was seen by a wound care specialist, a podiatrist, medicated compression wraps were utilized. Very helpful, obviously. I'm not trying to say that that's not important. But again, it kept causing recurrence of that ulcer. The ulcer kept opening back up. After talking to him, he did have a history of a right leg DVT about 10 years ago after knee surgery. And it was treated with warfarin at that time. He's currently on those meds, and again, he refuses to wear compression stockings. The minute I started talking about compression stockings, he was warning me off, Doc, I'm not using them. That's the whole reason I have this problem. Every time I put the stockings on, it causes, it rubs my ankle, and it causes this ulcer to open back up. And look how raw that looks, ladies and gentlemen. He is in a lot of discomfort, but he just wants to be left alone because he's worried that if somebody starts... Uh, what he shared with me later on was as somebody starts uh, checking this out more and more and doing further investigation, he had a cousin that had an amputation not too long ago. So his fear was that I was going to tell him that he needs an amputation. And he shared that with me down the road when he softened up. He was a very tough man. It was very hard to penetrate. But finally, when it got through to him that we can help him, then we sat down and we chatted about it. So he did have a deep venous ultrasound performed at an outside facility because they wanted to rule out a DVT. And here's the other issue. Not all deep vein ultrasounds are the same. We have some gurus in the room here that teach ultrasound to the world. They will be the first to say, just because you do a DVT rule out doesn't mean you've done a complete deep venous test, right? So this patient was told that they don't have a DVT. So what do we do at this point? You see the raw ulcer they have. Do you refuse until he becomes more compliant with his stockings? Do you start him on antibiotics and have him see an ID doctor? Or do you just give him some supportive care? Or do we do a venous ultrasound? And I think we all know the answer. We're going to check the superficial venous system. And again, no surprises here, ladies and gentlemen. The GSV was refluxing in the mid-thigh segment, greater than two se uh, seconds. Uh, 
And you know, the other thing was very interesting, I was surprised, and my tech was surprised, that the reflux was isolated in the thigh segment. So now you have an ulcer here, the vascular tech comes to me and says, Doc, there's isolated GSV reflux in the thigh segment only, and then I can see a cluster of veins in the base of that ulcer where there's reflux. So now the findings of the ultrasound are not consistent with the patient's presentation. That needs to be a red flag in our minds. We can't just ward this off, right? So what do we think about next? Do we go ahead and treat that isolated thigh segment GSV and those refluxing tributaries and see where this patient goes? Do we continue with wound care or do we check for supraingonal venous outflow obstruction? And again, I think all of us know where this is headed. This patient had a DVT, albeit it was treated 10 years ago adequately with warfarin, we all know that 48% of patients that have a DVT will go on to get post-thrombotic syndrome. And so this patient had a pelvic venous ultrasound done. Unfortunately, it's a common issue where it's hard to penetrate, especially with patients with larger girth or with a lot of overlying bowel gas. So that was the next hurdle, getting him to get a venogram and an IVUS, because again, he wanted to be left alone. But once we were able to discuss it with him and make him understand the connection between the deep and the superficial vein space, he agreed, and I'm glad he did. Because for those of you who don't know what a venogram is, you can see their dyes making its way up the right and left side, but you can see a couple of things. One thing is, is that, and I'm sorry I don't have a pointer, but one thing is, is that you can see the cross collateral as the veins are going across from the left to the right uh, iliac vein. The other thing you see is that you see that haziness in the right common uh, iliac vein. Those are all uh, telltale signs that there's something going on in that common iliac vein. But it's very important to utilize intravascular ultrasound because IVUS is, is, is pretty much the gold standard at this point in treating venous outflow obstruction, whether it's thrombotic or non-thrombotic. And so not surprisingly, the IVUS showed scarring, it showed ridges, and it showed sinicia or webbing within that vein. So this patient had venous outflow obstruction, post-thrombotic syndrome, for which he was suffering this ulcer. So what did we do? We went ahead and placed a dedicated deep iliac vein stent, and take a look at this, ladies and gentlemen. The collaterals are gone. Good sign, right? Collaterals are gone. We put one iliac vein stent there, a 16 by 120, and uh, the patient, how did he do? Well, he came back. He noticed that at six weeks, there was a decrease in his heaviness. The ulceration did not get better, but the heaviness and the swelling did improve, he told me. The ulcer, unfortunately, remained the same. Now what do we do? Treat the base of the ulcer. Get to the bottom of it now. Now, you, now that we fixed the venous outflow issue, we're, we know that the venous system is fine uh, north. Let's go ahead and treat at the base of the ulcer. So that's exactly what we did. We injected Verathena right into the base of those refluxing tributaries. Again, it was very uncomfortable for him. But again, at the end of the day, these patients are in so much discomfort, they're looking for some solution. So what do we do? Basically, again, our technique, elevate, access, elevate, and elevate for at least three minutes, if not five minutes. The more advanced the disease state, the longer I wait. Five minutes tends to be more the golden number for me as far as elevation. And we went ahead at six weeks, take a look at this, and at 12 weeks, we were able to close that ulceration completely. Completely. Again, this is a patient that wanted to be left alone. He thought that he needed, would be told that he needed an amputation, and he did not want to seek care. And so it gave us the ability to help this patient. But again, Barathena was what allowed me to really be able to close that ulceration once we treat the outflow obstruction. So I've done a little over 2,000 cases now. Um, what I like most about it, I think it's very easy to use as you become more comfortable with it. I think versatility goes without saying. Uh, satisfaction rates are phenomenal as you continue to get better and better. These patients come back very happy. We talked about tortuosity recanalization. And for me, C6 disease is most gratifying for me in being able to treat these patients. So in conclusion, Verathena is an essential non-thrombotic, non-tumescent choice, uh, sorry, a non-thermal, non-tumescent choice for us in our practices, because again, at the end of the day, ladies and gentlemen, it goes where other products don't, in any vein size or shape, up above or below the knee. And again, it provides clinically meaningful improvement of symptoms. There's data out there. Uh, I'm sure my Boston Scientific colleagues in the, in the room will be happy to share that data with you. There's a, there's a safety profile that has been demonstrated with, again, comprehensive clinical trials, and over 175,000 patients have been safely treated. So with that being said, we're gonna open up the forum for any questions, comments, share your thoughts with us, and please, another round of applause for our esteemed panel here. Thank you. Yes, please. You can see the recanalized GSV thrombosis with the Verathena chronic. 
so the question is, can you treat recanalized, chronically thrombosed GSVs with veratina? So I'd love to get the, the panel's input on that and their experience. Okay. So, in fact, veratina is, I was a champion of getting this product because we would ha traditionally have people who have either recanalized from previous procedures or, like I said, neovascularization from previous vein stripping procedures. And so the great thing about Virathena is if you're going to do reattempt re um, a thermal ablation in someone who's already had thermal ablation and they have noted scar tissue throughout that vein, what are they going to do when you're jamming a wire and catheter up through that scar tissue? They're going to come off the table. They're going to be really mad at you, and it can be very painful. Um, and you may not be successful in getting the wire and catheter to advance through that scar tissue. So that's why I love Verathena. In fact, I had a patient just like that who we did do thermal ablation on. I thought that was the best option. And then a year later, he returned. He had recanalized. Um, and I thought, wow, I can't believe he's, he's recanalized in a year. And I said, we're going to try Verathena and see if it will go ahead and close. And for some, for, for whatever reason, some people, I think even their endothelium reacts differently to thermal versus chemical ablation. And so we went in with the Verathena and treated that recanalized segment, and he has done amazingly well. Yes, so I love it. Dr. Vargas, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think it's, um, you know, sometimes it's, it's actually the only choice. Like before very thin, you're like, oh God, like, you know, it's, it's almost like it's your, it's, it's almost like, like your only option. To me, it's, I have someone with recanalization, I don't even think about uh, trying to treat that with any of the thermal methods. And uh, it just, you know, it's foam. It's going to go everywhere. It's going to get in between all that scarring. And it's, you know, the, the, the efficacy is, has been proven in widely open large veins. With this, I mean, I, I don't think there's anything that, at least as of today, compares to uh, just what Barithina can do in, in this specific situation. Yeah. So the question is, what about recanalized DVTs? And so I think the best way I would answer that is, depends on the chronicity of the DVT. Obviously it's chronic, it's hard, it's not going anywhere. Then by all means, I think those are the patients that will benefit the most, right? Because they're the ones that have those venous outflow obstruction issues where that pressure has increased and that venous hypertension has ensued. And just to kind of piggyback on the panel, I think that, yeah, I agree. Listen, Veratina goes where no other superficial disease treatment modality it goes where the others do not, right? But the key thing to understand is, is that it's treating patients, I know I don't have to say this, but I am going to say this. It's treating those that have recurrence of symptoms. Just because the vein has opened up doesn't mean we need to close the vein, right? If the patient comes back and they're symptomatic and they're doing all the right things and they've failed conservative measures, by all means, then I think it opens up the door to utilize Veratina on those scenarios. Yes? Great. I'm appreciating the questions. If I can just ask if, uh, anybody who wants to, to go to the mic so that everybody can hear. Uh, but the question I, I got here was, or what I heard from the, uh, my colleague here is that, what was the transition or how did we decide to use physician compounded foam versus not using physician compounded foam? So I'll let you all start. So um, just starting from, and, and I've actually had a patient who had um, a neurologic symptoms following a uh, ultrasound guided foam sclerotherapy years before, but just uh, even starting from that standpoint of knowing that because of the low uh, nitrogen concentration, you are essentially pretty much eliminating the risk for any of, of those symptoms. Whereas if you're treating, uh, you know, if you're if you're treating some you know reticular veins or if you're treating some smaller veins, I actually do have a number of patients in Florida that their insurance, like for example United, will not cover very thin. I don't know how it is in other states. So so some patients unfortunately 
ultrasound guided foam sclera therapy is still their their only option just because insurance doesn't cover um, but um, but if, if you're you know just just knowing that it's a more cohesive it's very uniform it we know that it displaces the blood exactly you know how we want it or and how we need for it to really come in contact circumferentially with that endothelium in order to work well um, that it is more stable all of those all of those things just you know you if you have the if you have both things and if insurance will cover for it you know it, it's it's a natural kind of transition to go with what's, what's safest and most effective. So, but I know that there's limitations as far as uh, states and, and, you know, approvals, but. I felt like using the physician compounded foam for those patients that had possibly a real tortuous anterior branch, for example, um, we knew they didn't have a long enough length to do thermal ablation at that time. So the only option I had back in the day was physician compounded foam. And traditionally, those patients would reopen a new tributary, usually within less than two years. They would be back to see me with either incomplete closure. Um, you would have parts of that vein that you treated with the physician compounded foam that only, only segments would be thrombosed um, or it would completely reopen. So I felt like I needed something far more superior that was going to be stronger than the physician compounded foam uh, for those patients. And that's when we in incorporated it into our practice. So the question is for those that uh, patients that have varicose veins, and please do come to the uh, mic if you have any questions. The, the question is, if you if anybody has varicose veins and they're large, bulgy, ropey varicose veins, which we've all seen in our practice, uh, what is the application of varathena to these cases, and what are there any tips and tricks that can be applied to that with closure rates? Uh, I will say, for one, when I first started using it uh, in the ropey, bulgy veins, uh, for me, my my number one concern was retained coagulum. And so, like I said, it's not that I've stopped using phlebectomy. I still utilize phlebectomy in my practice. It's just minimize the amount of scars and minimize, minimize the amount of micro stabs that I have to make in these patients. I want to drain that vein. I want to decrease that, co that potential coagulum ahead of time before I inject that medicine. Because once the medicine is injected, it has better wall contact and a better closure rate in that scenario. Question at the mic, please. Okay. So we are a high volume Veratina user. So we do about 400 cases a year. So, but our niche for Veratina, which some of you told us about, is to do below the knee in those that we cannot use venous seal, for example, in the tortuous vessel, or the vessel is very small, and also for treating the tributaries and the varicosity that, that are probably the major reason of why they recanalize. So that's, but I have, you know, you made, you do 500 cases, and why is this not just the primary modality for treatment and be it, because you can treat everything. It's cheap, cheaper than thermal, it's cheaper than uh, glue for sure, and, uh, and why not use it for everybody? And I'll tell you why I don't, and then maybe I want to see what you think. I think the primary success rate of treating the whole truncal vein is lower than thermal and, and non-thermal like uh, cyanoacrylate, but my concern is always DBT, and we take every, all the precautions that you say, but our incidence, and we have excellent sonographers, and that I think makes a difference on the incidence of DBT. Caffeine is what I'm talking about in, in the patients who have multiple perforators and so on. And I try to stay away from multiple perforators if they are big, even if it's an ulcer patient. You know, I would treat that uh, perforator first, and then treat in, in C5 and beyond disease. But my concern is DBT, and I, I try to do everything that the company tells us with the rep and everything are still, and we have great sonographers, so we find our incidence is still about 3%. Mm -hmm. Caffeine, asymptomatic, we almost never anticoagulate anybody, almost just aspirin. We pre-treat with aspirin, we continue aspirin for four weeks. So that's one I would like to hear yours, your input on why not this be the primary modality for everything, and how, you know, what's your incidence of DVT? And then we have this thing about the company tells us discard two cc's of sclerosin every time you load your syringe up. That wastes about 15 to 20% of the foam that's there in one bottle. And over when you're using such high volumes 
of, of that. I think we're discarding a lot of foam. I don't know whether there is a scientific reason for it that you have to do it. They, they tell us that it is the concentration may not be the same if you don't discard it. So that's something I want to know from the company because it's here. And then why not we do a head-to-head -head trial? Everybody is talking about you've been using STS for so long, and so did I. Why not we do Spectrum is doing now, comparing, you know, Venoseal to RF. Why not let's do a trial? I mean, you guys have the expertise. Pick 20 great operators and do a 500-patient trial. It shouldn't take very long. And just prove that Veritina is better than STS. Because when you do sclero, they say STS is stronger than Veritina because you see more denaturalization with STS than you see with Veritina. That's why, you know, sclera is better when you do spider veins. Yeah, of course, liquid. And, and we have started to use, well, I'll, I'll save that comment for later. <laughs> now, doctor, thank you, thank you. We appreciate your passion. Uh, and, you know, listen, this is your, again, you're preaching to the choir here. This is gospel to our ears because I think we're all on the same wavelength uh, in all of those issues and, uh, that you've discussed. But I think what I've gotten out of this is three questions. First question is, who do you not use Verathena in or who are you steering clear of using Verathena? Question number two is if you do get a DVT, what is your protocol? And question number three, um, which again, I think that the purg purging issue, I think that is more of a Boston scientific. I would let them kind of handle that part. And a head-to-head -head study, by all means, I think you have uh, six, seven, eight of us in the room would be ready to do that tomorrow. So I'll let the panel start, please. Okay, first I will talk about the incidental finding of the DVT because it does happen. And um, my theory on this is Physician compounded foam, as you asked about. How many times do we do physician compounded foam on a tributary that I do not scan those patients at one week follow up? And so, how many patients are out there with a gastroc clot or small little posterior tubule vein clot, very focal, that we do not even know about? And so, Sadly, some of this, the distal clot, is there because we have to look. We're obligated. We're scanning these patients at one week follow-up, and we're not doing that with every single physician compounded foam I inject. Um, so there's that. Um, and for which patients do I not? You know, unfortunately, I'm in a state with a hospital system that a lot of times it is insurance dictated, which I wish, wish it was not. And so, unfortunately, I feel like I have more patients that I need Verathena. I need them to be treated with this, their anatomy, and they won't cover it. Um, and so my hands are somewhat tied with that. Now, I will say this. Traditionally, who do I not use it for? Probably some of my younger patients that are 20, 30 years old. They have, uh, you know, an enlarged GSV. I know that the closure rate for thermal ablation, it has been studied. It's just been around longer. And so for those patients, I may go ahead and do thermal ablation versus the Verathena. I will tell you hands down, I, without a doubt, my older patients, 60, 70, 80 year olds who can't withstand pain, skin tissue integrity issues, patients on anticoagulation who are gonna bruise a lot more with tumescent, hands down, I'm doing Verathena for them. That is my first choice if I can get it approved with insurance. 100%. Okay. Dr. Yeah, the only comment, yeah, I, I echo what has been said. I, I, and my, my other thing with the DVT, and I, I've, to, I've spoken about this with some people who I think share the same feeling. There's literally no, probably no, sci, no, not a lot of scientific data behind this, but I do feel that even with thermals, when we see the hits, it's almost like it's a different animal. It's not, it doesn't, it doesn't behave like a DVT. It's not a spontaneous DVT that if you don't anticoagulate has, you know, a high potential of, you know, propagation and, and embolization. So, and, and I think there's, there's almost like a, like a trend down there. It wouldn't surprise me that if later down the line, sooner or later, that we even stop scanning for DVT post-procedure, end of story. Because at the end of the day, we're doing all of these ultrasounds and what is the real incidence with any of these methods at the end of the day um, to where it just, in my mind, I, I'm not too worried about that yeah, in yeah. reality. But again, that's just, I'm not saying that this is backed up by science or anything. This is just my own experience. I, I honestly don't worry too, too much about it. I think that, you know, there's obviously always a chance. But again, with the medication, once, in, once it goes into a deeper vein, it just gets d diluted and inactivated pretty quickly. So I personally don't worry too, too much about the, the DVT aspect of things. But again, I still... 
uh, do you know a lot of uh, thermal treatments, both with laser and radio frequency. And I think at this point, it's also again we, it's there, there's no way we're gonna you know take away from the fact that we've had thermal thermal methods forever, and we're all extremely comfortable with them. Um, but um, but again, just seeing how easy and safe varithina is, it's you know you you start. And the more comfortable you get, you just start doing it more and more to where, yeah, maybe, maybe we end up replacing that just, you know, for that small benefit. I mean, you asked me, sure. you know, one thermal yeah. versus the other. I right. mean, and sometimes even just having a treatment length of 10 versus 7 centimeters, gee, I want to be done sooner. So, you know, it's, there's real no big difference, but those little differences between one another end sure. up dictating what you do for most of your practice. So it wouldn't surprise me that later down the line, yeah. we end up just doing Barithina, yeah. for example, yeah. or whatever new thing comes up later down the line, right? Very thorough, very thorough answers. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to go to our last question. Gentleman here at the mic, please. Yes, I wanted to ask you about uh, Verathena and uh, small saphenous veins. I'm assuming the reason you haven't discussed it was the original studies and the FDA didn't approve it because of the incidence of caffeine thrombosis. But that being aside, uh, do you use Verathena for small saphenous vein closure? Are, are we allowed to answer that question? <laughs> Is this a setup? Yes, I have used it. I have definitely used yes. it, and it works great. We're not allowed to discuss it, um, but yes, I have used it. Yes, same here. We've used it. It's, we've been reimbursed for it. Uh, just, you know, practice all the precautionary measures uh, that, uh, that uh, you know, one would. Uh, Dirk, you have something to answer? Uh, not to that discussion. Can you hear me okay? Um, but uh, there's a couple questions on reimbursement. So the first question was, and they talked a little bit about, can you get reimbursed for just treating tributaries? It's a really good question because it's in our indication to treat tributaries. A lot of the policies cover tributaries, but the CPT code is for truncal veins. And so the, the answer there is you can use Verathena in tributaries. You can build a regular sclero codes if you're just doing tributaries. If you're treating a truncal vein and you flow into a tributary, then you can build a, a 3646566, -6 which is the compound or the non-compounded foam. Um, so hopefully that answers that question. But you do have to be very diff very careful if you're just treating tributaries, billing 36465 or 66, because that is not the intent of those codes. The intent of those codes is an uh, ablation, endovascular ablation of truncal veins. Another question was. Um, they were just asking kind of generally about the reimbursement. So almost every payer reimburses, except for one we heard about today, which is United Healthcare. We're working on them. Love to have everybody in this room send them some kind of message that you think this is an important tool for, you, for them because they're the, one of the very few holdouts. Others will um, allow you to treat just as a distal. And we have a tool called uh, Payer Analytics, which we'd be happy to share with you. We have it for each state in the country. We, we kind of pick out the payers in your area and we show you what we think we see as the coverage, so it's kind of a cheat sheet for you. We're happy to get that to you. And then um, finally, the last question was, can you treat, I think it was a question about treating ulcers, uh, and that's a difficult one because, again, if you're treating a truncal vein, flows into the tributaries, which are in, in the ulcer bed, then you're fine. If you're just treating an ulcer, I would suggest, because I think there's excellent medically necessary reasons to do that, but you've got to get that permission up front to do that if you're just treating an ulcer with just, and then you're just treating tributaries. There are some policies like Cigna that have high risk, low risk patients. High risk are those ulcer patients and they allow that kind of treatment. But again, I would make sure that you have a prior authorization and, medical ne and medically necessary to do that. Thank you, Dirk. That was very... Oh, interesting. So you're saying Anthem is asking you for the size of the tributary? Just like they talk about the junction and the proximal segment, you know, so on. They're asking that the size should be greater than point three. Yeah, so that's a really good example because the policies are different from one of the others you yeah. guys all know. And right? they change so often, unfortunately. Correct. Yeah. So, yeah, but, you know, staying, I'm, I'm health economics, market access for Boston. We have a team that is happy to come out and help you. We have field reimbursement managers that will help you understand your local reimbursement. So reach out to us. We'll be happy to help. So in the AMA guidance document, which is a March CPT assistant 2018, they do include the SSV in that. that. I can't recommend it. It's, a, it's, it's off label for us. 
most policies cover it, um, but not all. So again, be very careful with that too. But. So uh, with that, I'd like to officially end the session. We'll all be hanging out here, so if you have any questions afterwards, please grab us. I'd like to again, once again thank Boston Scientific, Christine Villarreal and her team for putting this all together. So thank you guys so much. <laughs> <laughs>